I have two words for you, postpartum charting. That is the number one topic I've been getting questions about lately. So I want to invite you to an exciting live masterclass I'm hosting all about postpartum charting on July 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern. And yes, it's free. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash postpartum to register today. A replay will be sent out, but only to those who've registered. So head over to fertilityfriday.com slash postpartum to reserve your spot today. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 320. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I manage to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. I have an exciting episode to share with you today. In today's episode, I'm sharing my interview with Dr. Thenis Kruger. And in case you're not familiar with his work, you can't really study sperm quality morphology without running into his work. So just to give you an example, if you've ever had your partner's sperm analyzed, or you've interacted with a health professional (laughs) related to a sperm analysis, and you've noticed on the sperm analysis, it'll say, you know, strict and morphology strict, and it'll give you a percentage of, you know, the abnormal or normal sperm. That standard related to sperm morphology was actually developed by Dr. Thenis Kruger. So I was really excited to have the opportunity to speak with him and to really go in depth into sperm quality, morphology, and what prompted him to develop those standards and how they then became kind of accepted worldwide for how we look at sperm and kind of how it changed the way that sperm was even looked at and thought of and how quality was thought to be related to your chances of conception. So I'm sure you'll find this episode interesting, particularly if you are trying to conceive or if you have concerns about sperm quality. And so with that said, let's jump right into my conversation with Dr. Kruger. And I'm very excited and honored today to be here with Dr. Thenis Kruger. Dr. Kruger is the founder of the first IVF clinic in South Africa, and he's also the proud co-founder and partner of Avita's Fertility Clinic. Professor Dr. Kruger acted as leader of the team at Tyberg Fertility Clinic, which led to the first test tube baby in South Africa in 1984 the first frozen embryo pregnancy in South Africa in 1988, the first baby born from ICSI in South Africa in 1995, so, and also the standardization of international sperm morphology guidelines by the World Health Organization from research conducted by his team. So I'm very happy to have you here with us, Dr. Kruger. Thank you for, for coming on the show. Thank you. It's uh, really an honor. Well, I mean, you've done so much work in the field of fertility. So as I was going through the short summary of some of the highlights of your work, obviously you've been incredibly involved in artificial reproductive technologies and really at the forefront of those developments. But in particular, I asked you here today to talk about the standardization of the international sperm morphology guidelines. I've read a number of your research papers and you know, this is an area that I'm always talking about on the podcast and a particular area of interest for myself. And so the first question that I have for you is, what brought you to focus on fertility challenges and in particular challenges of sperm morphology? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I Perhaps I can just uh, give a little background also on my my love for the USA and uh, the fact that I did my fellowship there. And the story that I'm going to tell you is a story between Cape Town, South Africa, and then USA later at the Jones Institute in Norfolk, Virginia. And it dates back to 1985-86, a long time ago. What happened is that I'm a gynecologist uh, with an interest in male infertility. Uh, the reason in those years was that the male was very neglected and I, I just became interested because we could do so little for the men and could explain uh, very little. So I've observed during time of laparoscopy where I did some smears inside the pelvis of the female and then saw, sometimes saw spermatozoa and I stained them and observed that there's one specific type of sperm that you will find in the body of the female. But when you look at a raw sample of semen, there are many varieties in shape. Shapes and sizes are different. What I've observed and what my fellow colleagues observed, and there was a specific scientist uh, working with me, Dr. Mengfeld, we saw that the head of the sperm in the body looks like an acorn. Are you familiar with the acorn tree? Yes. Yeah. So that shape of the acorn, that was, that's, that's what we saw. So we stained and counted them and measured them and then we developed a theory, and I was busy with my PhD at that stage, a post-gynecology uh, study on aspects affecting IVF results. And one of the aspects that I wanted to study was the male. So we then saw in men that some men will only have 2% of the so-called acorn type or oval-shaped sperm and others will have 14, 15, 16, 20%. And in the IVF laboratory then, we, you can standardize your number of sperm that you fertilize. So you will have 10 oocytes in, in one couple. You standardize the number of sperm that you fertilize the egg with. But the morphology, of course, will vary dependent on the male. And then we saw... And you must ask me now, we saw a linear improvement in fertilization the higher the morphology. So example, if the morphology was 1 and 2 and 3%, we saw a very few eggs fertilized, a rate of about 15%. So 10 eggs, one fertilized. If we deal with a male with... 18 or 19 or 20 percent of the oval sperm, we saw that there was 80, 90 percent fertilization rate. So very different. And uh, we, of course, statistical analysis on the data set. And in in the first study, we saw a drop in pregnancies at the level of below 14 percent. But the study was not very big, and our statistician clearly said that we'll have to enlarge the numbers. But there was no doubt in our minds that the morphology is, a play, is playing a role in fertilization and also then in pregnancy rate, because if you are dealing with less embryos, you'll have a lower pregnancy rate. And that, is, that was what we've seen. So... I'm going to stop here, but the story is now going to the USA. But I, I want you to ask me questions because I want to be sure that your listeners understand what I tried to say. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. So it sounds to me that you, you were analyzing the sperm and you noticed that the sperm of a certain shape, so the sperm of more of a normal morphology, you found a connection between the number or percentage of normal sperm and the pregnancy rates. Yeah, also in, in fertilization, because the power 
of that study in 80, published in, I think in 86, was that we could see the impact on fertilization. And because you could, you, you've got one dish, one egg, 50,000 sperm inside, but in the one patient morphology will be 1% and the other one, it will be 15%. One could clearly see that there was a, a impact on fertilization. So the lower the morphology, the lower the fertilization. Sometimes no eggs fertilized. And I just want to, to underline that at that stage in the world literature, there was total agreement that morphology is not playing a role at all in the fertilization process. It was considered not important and count and the movement of sperm was said to be important. I would say that was a first phase in the research, but because no one else believed it, I published it, but then moved to the States for my postdoc fellowship at the Jones Institute in Norfolk, Virginia. And perhaps I must tell the story. I, I arrived there. I was, of course, um, 86. I was much younger and uh, coming out of Africa. And the, I observed in the mornings when the doctors sat around Dr. Howard Jones that sometimes they said no fertilization in this patient or very poor fertilization, it must be an egg factor. Those were the words. I looked at those patients and then I saw, but it's a morphological problem. It's the morphology that's low, good count, low morphology. And I told Dr. Howard Jones, I think it's morphology. I've observed that in Cape Town. I was not sure if what we've observed was applicable to other parts of the world. But I then said, let's do a blind prospective study. That meant that we, I didn't know what is going to be reported. I just reported the morphology and then gathered the information on the patient's fertilization later. So it was totally blind for me. But within a, a few days, actually a few weeks, the scientists, uh, that was Lucinda Fick and Dr. Howard and others, uh, said, but they think I, I can predict what is going coming because I'm now like a little witch doctor from, the, from, from Africa because I could tell them before they even told me what's going to happen. This patient will uh, fertilize less than 25% and that one should fertilize if the eggs are normal. 80, 90% of eggs. So that's the story. And that led to a publication, almost a repeat of the work in Cape Town. And then we described the first patterns. Uh, what is a pattern? It is uh, where, the, where the fertilization was very low in the uh, low morphology groups. We call that the P pattern or poor prognosis pattern. That was in cases with 0 to 4% normals. And then we described a G pattern or good prognosis pattern. And in that study, the fertilization rate was 63%. And then the third pattern was above 14% normal forms. That was called the N pattern, uh, normal pattern. And the fertilization there was like 90%. So you can clearly see in that those studies, a stepwise uh, upward improved fertilization, the higher the morphology was. Mm -hmm. Well, this is very interesting. So this is specific then to artificial reproductive technology when you're looking specifically at the fertilization yes. and the link between the morphology and how successful the fertilization is going to be. And for the listener who isn't really sure about morphology, so it's the word to describe the the sperm, whether the sperm yep. is normal or not. And the sperm, if you look at it under a microscope, some of them don't have a head. Some of them, you know, they have all kinds of different issues Shapes. with how they look. Yep. And 
what you said, which I found really interesting as well, was that before you had done this work and focused on could morphology be affecting fertilization, it was mm-hmm. assumed that if the egg, if, it, if fertilization didn't take place, that there was an issue with an egg or yes. the egg instead of looking at that. So that is really just interesting. And I think even to this day, there's still a lot of that because when a couple is trying to conceive and it's not happening, the assumption is often the default that it must be the woman. So because your research is then, or at least at this stage, was focused on fertilization within this context, could you tell us what the impact that this could have on a couple's chance of conceiving naturally? Yeah, I think uh, there was a long time the misconception that if we classify a patient in the P pattern, poor prognosis pattern, morphology of three or four percent normal, that they cannot impregnate their their wife. And that's not true. So one must immediately say that if the morphology is read correctly, even by uh, the top experts in the world, and you are sure that the report is accurate, uh, that I never, and I'm repeating, never t- tell a patient that you cannot impregnate your wife. You can. It can happen. But we know that uh, in in those f- first uh, studies that the the rates of success are lower in the in the morphology. But if you are dealing with a male factor, the doctor must always make sure about the female. And when I lecture on the male or on infertility, I it, it takes two to tango. So one must look at the male and you must correct him. And we will perhaps talk about, you know, factors that can affect the, uh, the outcome of the uh, male uh, factor, can improve it. And you must focus on the female, you know, weight, smoking, uh, cycles. Is she ovulating well? And you must always correct it. So misconception is... If the morphology is low, now you must have ICSI. You must have in vitro. We always try at home and will only move to other treatment modalities if they've tried long enough. Well, so you shared that with the two studies that you described that you did, you listed a level of 14% uh, or higher as normal, and that had the increased or the the highest chance of fertilization uh, within that context. And also a really important point, because when you go through the research about morphology, there are researchers who would still argue that morphology doesn't really matter, uh, because it is always possible, provided that the male partner has some degree of sperm, it is possible, as you said, for their partner to become pregnant. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I think there's definitely a misconception that people are so dogmatic and doctors can be so dogmatic about the male that they then don't give them a chance. Uh, And that's not true. And I underline again, even if you're in the P pattern group, you can still have a natural pregnancy. It's a marker of, let's say it's a red flag. It tells you something is not right. And you must then go into the history of that male and correct what you can. And often there will be uh, even an improved morphology if the smoking stops, marijuana is important, you know, overweight is important, lose weight and so on. And medication, self-medication, all those things must be excluded so that you get a healthy male and female. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle, very important. Well, so I've noticed a trend with the women who I've worked with who've had their partners semen analyzed. And one of the trends that I've noticed is that regardless of what the analysis says, unless it's below the, the World Health Organization guidelines in one of the three main areas, they're often just told that it's normal, you know, period, full stop. And Mm. So, for example, unless the morphology is below 4%, they're not told anything 
And Mm. so you mentioned a few, you know, I'd like to expand on that. You mentioned a few things that could impact sperm. Uh, But for the woman who's listening, you know, what would you want her to know about morphology? Is there like, should, should we be looking at when the morphology is in a sub fertile or suboptimal range? And then is that an opportunity to involve the male partner to make some changes to try to improve, as you mentioned? Again, with respect to the physicians, as you know, there's still debate. And in certain centers, uh, they don't believe in morphology. Often they don't have the scientist trained to do a good strict morphology. But whatever the case, let's say they are in our clinic and we confirm that it's a P pattern, we will, we will not, I'm repeating again, not jump to ICSI. We will make sure about the natural fertility to get it as high as possible on the female side. And if it's a young couple, we will encourage them to try at home, but correcting the female. Sometimes uh, it's something simple, like she's not totally ovulatory. So her cycles can vary between 22 and 33 days. So in those cases, you can uh, give them a fertility medication to stimulate the ovulation, find the fertile day, and give them an opportunity to fall pregnant in spite of his so-called low morphology. He can impregnate her. I think, again, takes two to tango. Important to look at the male, correct what is wrong. We can also talk about supplements here and then uh, correct the female and see if you can't make her more fertile. And that will compensate for any male factor, low count, lower motility. So important to look at both. Well, for the listener who may not be familiar with ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, that's when, if they're going through artificial reproductive technology, when the sperm is directly injected into the egg and then placed uh, in the uterus. Uh, just so for the listener who may have heard you say ICSI and, and wasn't sure what that is, could you share with us then if if you do identify that the male does have the P pattern, as you said, so poor, so the lower number of morph- or lower morphology number, you mentioned a few things that can be done. So in your practice, it's kind of a two part question. What are some of the, the, the things that men can focus on when they, we have identified that they have a low morphology and there could be some degree of male factor? And how long can a couple expect it to take before some of those changes actually take effect? If the morphology is low, uh, now we're getting a little technical, but I always ask in our lab uh, at least three scientists to read the morphology because uh, you, you must be trained to do it. So make sure that the lab that you are using is not overly strict, but let's assume the morphology is low. Then if your lifestyle is good, the only other thing that you can do is, and there's a lot of literature on that, eat a lot of healthy food. Junk food, not indicated. Not good for morphology. I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in the African green monkey model. I'll, I'll tell you now, it's an interesting one. But there's a good literature saying lots of greens and vegetables and free of pesticides That is good. And also uh, free range chickens and and that type of thing will enhance uh, fertility. Uh, There's interesting work on that. But can I just deviate for a second? In the 90s, there was a study at the Medical Research Council here in Cape Town on heart conditions and the effect of diet on the cholesterol and so on of African green monkeys, African green monkey. So it was totally ethically cleared and half of the monkeys received an African uh, ordinary, we call it bush diet, 
normal, healthy berries and, you know, things that, that they usually eat. And half of the monkeys receive more a Western diet with more fat intake and so on. And the morphology of the African green monkey, African green monkey from the bush, and you test the sperm, almost all the sperm are like acorns. Isn't that interesting? Almost every sperm. So if you count 100 sperm, 99 will look perfectly normal in contrast with the male, with the human, human male contrast. So it's a very good model to study diet and it was done and it was clearly seen that in the Western diet, unhealthy diet, the morphology was affected. That study was done blind and it was, the slides were read by my colleague, Dr. Mengfeld, who's a scientist, and he didn't know which ones were which ones and could clearly see the impact of the diet on the African green morphology. So indirectly, one can then extrapolate and say the studies on the human, where they showed better pregnancy rates, where you eat healthily, it's got some merit, and one can can um, yeah talk about that uh, more. Something else that I want to just tell you: the cheetah. We are working with veterinarians here in South Africa, and uh, the listeners will know about lions and cheetahs. And there's uh, veterinarians studying the fertility of these animals because they the cheetah is, is endangered. If you inbreed the lion or inbreeding in the cheetah, their morphology goes down tremendously. So I'm wondering if there's not also a genetic factor in the human, not you say, only Could you lifestyle. describe in, inbreeding when you say that? Just clarify what that in breeding, means. Inbreeding, small farm, so the same population impregnating each other, and then the fertility will go down. So Less genetic diversity? Yes. Okay. So it's just... Uh, just, I'm just telling it because I found it fascinating and interesting. And it tells you something. Nature can always teach you something. So um, diet, important. And we have the, the African green monkey model. But there was, there's also very good clinical studies showing the value of lifestyle change and good diet. Mm -hmm. Infertility, male and female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. It mm -hmm. leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you, which is, could you share your perspective then on why there's been this decline in male sperm count and quality? So I know that there's a bit of debate, but when you look at different research papers from different periods of time, the 1940s, I found a few studies that had samples from men in the 1940s. And if you find samples from men today, there's a significant decline just in the count specifically in the concentration. If you can find morphology numbers, you'll see, you know, the, they've declined as well as the motility numbers. So do you have a comment on why it's been such a significant decline? It's Scandinavian work, a lot of Scandinavian work, and, you know, they've got very good data records. Uh, Skarkebeek is one of the, you know, leading scientists in the field. They speculate that, uh, you know, there's more estrogen in the water, water pollution, plastic, you know, that type of thing. I am not an expert in this field, but, you know, like you quoting the literature, I can quote the literature, we see the trends but I think it's, it's possibly uh, toxins. Mm -hmm. Well, and is there, so there's some research on the sperm DNA damage, so whether the sperm is damaged and how that could relate to morphology. So if the male has been exposed to more oxidative stress or if that's had a negative impact on his, on his sperm and uh, so do you do you have a comment on whether there is a link between morphology and the the quality of the sperm in terms of the actual kind of integrity of the DNA? 
Yeah, very important question. And the short answer is yes. We've done studies in the 90s on different aspects, oxygen species, the DNA damage, and sperm morphology, and we did see a correlation. But you can all, uh, I think, as part of full evaluation of the male, one must actually, in all men, but all labs and clinics can't do it, do a DNA evaluation, a tunnel assay, we call it. It's one of the tests, because that will give you sometimes DNA damage in a so called fertile male. But if you're asking, Trends, the P pattern, the poor prognosis, the low morphology will have more DNA damage than the male in the N pattern or high G pattern. I just want to share with you, uh, I think, very interesting data, recent data, where uh, they were single. We, we've done population studies, and what I've just said was on big semen samples. But these scientists, when the ICSI came, the injection of one sperm at a time, the first person to report an impact on embryo quality and pregnancy outcome was a lady with the name of De Vos. And she's from Brussels, uh, one of the big clinics there. And she saw that if there is a a uh, male where she could not find a uh, healthy oval type sperm, that the, the morphology of the embryos were poorer and the pregnancy outcome was poorer. And that uh, gave a hint that even morphology becomes very important in the lab, in the ICSI arena. Because after, when ICSI came, I was sitting in a conference in Paris and there was a scientist saying, now that we have ICSI, uh, sperm is not important anymore. You can inject, inject any sperm and you'll get an embryo and a pregnancy. And of course, he was totally, totally wrong. It was a very, not a very thoughtful statement because as things progressed, it became important that uh, the DNA damage can be in sperm and that you must select the sperm very well. I can uh, talk a little bit about a guy from Yale called Professor Uzar's work, if you want me to, because it, it illustrates this point, or do you want to ask other questions? Um, no, you can go ahead. Yeah, so he observed that uh, the mat a mature sperm develops hyaluronic acid receptor so that that sperm can bind, if it's mature and healthy, to a hyaluronic acid. And he saw that the morphology of those sperm were also, interestingly, more oval-type sperm. So that observation led to more detailed studies on single sperm. And there's a study where they've looked at uh, two groups, one, one sperm at a time. That was fascinating. Testing for DNA fragmentation, testing for mitochondrial damage, testing for DNA abnormality, and they describe the sperm. They say a sperm with no defect, that's the oval type, or in the other group, a sperm with vacuoles and other, mis other we call it amorphous, misshapen sperm. And they saw a clear difference. The, the oval shape with no vacuoles were healthier from a DNA fragmentation point from mitochondrial damage compared to those misshapen amorphous sperm. And I, I thought that was one of the most elegant studies where they've isolated sperm and then test sperm uh, by sperm and not populations. We could not do it in, in the 90s. 
we did population studies, we saw trends, but here it was very clear that you must select your sperm well, even if you do the injection of sperm into the egg, which we call ICSI. Just popping into today's episode with a question for you. Do you have questions about postpartum charting? Have you wondered if it's possible to use fertility awareness successfully after you've had a baby? If so, you're invited to join me for a live masterclass that I'm hosting on July 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern. And yes, it's free. All about postpartum charting. You'll want to register even if you're not able to join us live so that you can access the replay. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash postpartum to register today. Again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash postpartum. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Well, so that's very interesting. I mean, oh. there's this idea, which isn't entirely wrong, but um, I think it's helpful to question it a little bit, that all you need is one. So there's kind of this idea that, you know, men have millions of sperm, but all you really need is one. Uh, yeah. And so what you just shared where the study was done and they were testing the individual sperm yeah. and the the normal morphology of the sperm was related to the quality of the DNA. Yeah. It's interesting because then, so does that suggest that if a man has a higher percentage morphology, does it suggest that overall the DNA or the sperm in general might be a better quality compared to a man who has a lower morphology? Or do you think it, it's not necessarily related and it's more uh, on an individual sperm basis? No, I think it's the population important, but then you're talking about natural fertilization and the body's got the capability, the cumulus cells around the oocyte to select sperm. And we don't know, but I assume that the, you know, the oval type will go in. Why do I assume it? Because we've done studies, hemizona assay, so we cut eggs in half and then compared low morphology men with normal morphology men. And we looked at the binding and we developed an assay in the 90s and uh, noted that less sperm could bind successfully on the egg shell, that's the zona pellucida, the egg shell, in the low morphology men, where there were sperm in abundance that could bind. So for the listener, one can then say that it's like a key in a lock. So there's a lot of potential in the morphology that is normal to unlock the lock and enter the egg, where the low morphology men perhaps due to amorphous sperm and so on, very few sperm bound on the egg. One could clearly see that. So it's all direct and indirect evidence that one mustn't just brush morphology aside. Even at the cellular level, it becomes important. We started off with an observation on fertilization we started off with the observation of the type of sperm inside the female body, and still we see the trend, the same trend. So the scientists in the lab must be also very careful when they do the ICSI treatment, which they are aware. Most clinics are very aware of that. And by that, you mean, are you saying that the, the scientist has to be aware of this so that they are intentional about which sperm that they're selecting yes. <laughs> yeah yeah because uh, you yeah, said they you know, used what, to believe it it wasn't relevant but there's uh, enough what, evidence what, now yeah absolutely what we do in our lab is we do we select the sperm with hyaluronic acid there's a little dish called pixie it was developed by uzar from yale and then we fish those sperm that's got the ability to bind on hyaluronic acid we fish them out and put them in a little dish. Then we look at the morphology and we see, we've tried to find the ideal sperm based on all the things that I've told you. 
then we inject them and we our reasoning is we have physiological data behind us so why not do that why must one you know so, uh, just take a sperm randomly you can make bigger mistakes with that mm -hmm. well and by doing that you would be increasing the the chance of a successful fertilization that oh. is uh, uh, not successful fertilization but quality embryo because right. that man in paris was right you can inject any sperm and you get uh, an embryo but often they are chromosomally abnormal when you are working with morphology and so on and so on so do your best to find the best sperm mm -hmm. and that produces the better quality embryos yeah. well yes. this is all very fascinating i wanted to go back to uh when you were talking about the the fertilization and um what you said about the key and the lock and how mm. the lower morphology numbers there were fewer successful basically the sperm connecting with the egg so there and yes. so what's interesting i mentioned to you that in the work that i do i help women to understand the menstrual cycle and so yes. with fertility awareness charting cervical fluid is essential to most of the main methods of fertility awareness and so when you you know the research around cervical fluid is fascinating women are producing it before they're ovulating so in that fertile window and the cervical fluid has the ability to filter out abnormal sperm. And so there's different studies. Some of them are showing the quality of the sperm after they've passed through the mucus, and some of them are analyzing the action of it. But mm. I just thought that that was an interesting uh, addition to what you said, because even though I think a lot of women are kind of shocked to discover that even the healthiest man typically has a huge percentage of abnormal sperm and it's fairly normal and common for the majority of sperm that men produce to be actually abnormal but we do have this natural screening process within our bodies that then helps to select the better quality sperm i'm not sure if you have a comment on that yes i i have uh, you're absolutely correct and i th i think that's why later on we we also looked at morphology in the mucus we even took mucus and then put sperm on this side in a dish and see what comes out at uh, in the end uh, what type of sperm and it's 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 that selection process so the mucus is definitely helping and the the amorphous sperm do not do as well as the oval shaped sperm and, and that is what we've observed in the body and when you trace it back it starts with the selection of the mucus. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I could just talk about this all day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I wanted to go back to something also that you mentioned when you were talking about the, the testing. So at the very beginning of our conversation, when I introduced you, I mentioned that your work was an integral part of creating a standardized process for classifying sperm morphology and that was crucial for developing the world health organization guidelines and yes. so you you mentioned that individuals have to be trained and when you're doing it you have three scientists looking at it so mm -hmm. could you share with us then so for a woman who's listening who's had a semen analysis. So it sounds like there's different ways to do this semen anal analysis and different mm -hmm. labs are doing it differently. So is there any, I suppose, just information that women should have or in these situations when they're getting this information from their doctors about morphology? I think uh, number one, if, if, if the, let me just say, if you're living in Switzerland, the whole of Switzerland is totally standardized, disciplined, standardized. And when you do a morphology reading in Basel and you take that same slide and you give it to someone in Bern, the reading will be very, very similar. So the reports are very reliable. Now, uh, sometimes a scientist can make a fertile male more can put him in the pee pattern and then the patient get, gets a fright. And I think perhaps that's the biggest message today. Even if your morphology is low, relax about it. 
make sure that your lifestyle is good. If your count is good, your motility is good, you can impregnate your wife if she is in top condition. So I think that's a principle. Number one, to ask a scientist for the slide and get a second opinion from another clinic is also valuable and they should not be feel threatened because then, you know, if, if two people say, yes, we agree, it's definitely a, a P pattern, then you know it, but you know it with insight. So no doctor must give you a fright. That's, that's definitely not on. If you're young, 28, and you've got a low morphology, and you've corrected your lifestyle, and the doctor corrected your wife's fertility, hang in there, wait a little bit, wait a year, follow this natural way, the American, natural American, old west way to impregnate your wife. It can happen. So often there's this misconception that some doctors say, I say, that if it's a P pattern, they must go immediately to Ixin, and that is not true. So I hope I'm clear on the broad picture. Well, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is that it's possible for the scientist who is looking at the sperm specifically hmm. to be too strict and yes, possibly absolutely. make it seem like if they're if they're really follow, like looking at the guidelines and being a little bit too strict, that it could seem as though the man has lower sperm parameters than he really does. Mm. And also that I, I hear what you're saying, that there's this tendency to assume that if there's a problem, you got to go straight to IVF and ICSI, yeah, not, which, not true. which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the, so I, I, I would be interested to hear your comment because, you know, when looking at the research, there would be an indication that if a man has lower sperm parameters, so mm. if he has lower morphology or mm. if he has a higher level of the sperm DNA damage, mm. that it could potentially in some cases take a longer duration of time to conceive, but it doesn't mean that conception is impossible. That is true. That is absolutely true. I also want to say that if there's ever a uncertainty about a slide, a morphology, I get requests from all over the world. So people ask for a second opinion and they send the slides by DHL or by just post with a semen um, report and then can ask for a second opinion on the morphology through their doctor or directly and uh, we ask $50 to read the slide because it takes time on top of our other work, but uh, we will gladly do that if there's ever a difficult case. Well, I think that's interesting. Between that aspect of it and what you said earlier about having a number of scientists look at the results, it mm. suggests that you could have results and you could have two different people looking at the results and to have two different outcomes. And so, for example, you developed the strict. So for mm. any of the listeners who are, they're pulling up their morphology tests or they're pulling up their sperm analysis right now and looking at them, typically some of the labs will actually say Kruger strict yes. morphology beside it and give the number. So is it mm. possible then that if the lab is not using the specific say, Kruger strict guidelines, that that number be, could be overestimating the number of healthy sperm? They usually underestimate. They usually uh, take a G pattern patient and they're too strict and put them in the P pattern group. Okay. Um, that is what usually happens. Okay. So it's much less common for it to be the reverse if yeah, they're not uh, using the strict if it's guidelines. It's a very, very severe P pattern, uh, you cannot miss it, you know, the, all the sperm are amorphous. That's, that's, it's now, we, we become now very technical, but I th think that in certain cases, certain labs are not, are too strict, and then they, but the listener must know, even if my morphology is low, but my count is good, I have a chance of a pregnancy. I think that's perhaps our biggest message of the day. And then lifestyle, 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 very important because you are affecting your, your uh, DNA by doing the wrong things. 
uh, sport is important. Cycling does not affect, does not affect the morphology. Long distance running, even marathons, will bring the, the count down a little bit, but not in the subfertile range. And people can run and they can do cycling because there's this misconception also in the literature. I've written a chapter in a book for on sport and the effect of sport on, on morphology. I've reviewed the literature quite extensively and uh, there's very few sports that really impact on the morphology. Of course, the bodybuilders, that's a big problem. And uh, if they are using anabolic steroids, the, the biggest impact is no sperm. You know, they become azoospermic. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one final question for you. Mm. You bring up an important point, and I find it interesting. So from both sides, that provided that your male partner has sperm, mm. men are not identified as sterile. Yeah. So these parameters, the quality of the sperm, uh, there's like provided that there's sperm, yeah. your partner will not be classified as sterile because there is a chance of conception when he has sperm. But could you share with us, like in what cases are men actually classified as sterile? I think the, the easy one is you do a semen analysis, there's no sperm, and you you must, of course, examine the male and understand why and do blood tests and so on. Uh, do chromosomal tests, do hormonal tests, and then repeat it again. And if it's a second, a month later, and if it's a second time and a third time azoospermic, then uh, one can say at that point that male is sterile, then one must consider a testis biopsy and see if there's sperm in, in the testis or this micro stuff, you know, there's an other uh, road to follow with those men. They, they are sterile. If there's um, the World Health Organization threshold values, say you're in the subfertile range, hear the word, subfertile, not sterile. You're in the subfertile range when the count is below 10 million per milliliter, when the motility is below 30%, and your morphology is below four, subfertile. That doesn't mean you cannot impregnate your wife. And of course, if you fall in the subfertile range, one must look at the factors that I've talked about, the lifestyle factors, and any drug or medication must be looked at carefully to see if that's not impacting and then see if you can't improve the quality by changing lifestyle or habits or medication, all depends. And I always, I like to give antioxidants uh, uh, like vitamin C, 300 milligrams a day, uh, 40 milligrams of zinc and folic acid. Those uh, vitamins, those three has been researched and they cheap and you can buy it over the counter and make your own fertility vitamin concoction and uh, there's good evidence that that can help you there are many medications on the market that's very expensive that i think one must be very careful you must look at the evidence if there's no evidence don't use that um, but you can do what i've just said lifestyle 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 plus if you want a supplement uh, use uh, the zinc, the vitamin C, and the folic acid, which is a good choice. Mm -hmm. I feel like the you know there's a few main messages that have come out in our conversation today, but you know one thing that I'm taking away from it is that even if there is an issue that is detected with the male side, uh, mm -hmm. there's so many very practical, some common sense, some degree to common sense things you can do, but there's. Uh, much that you can do to improve the quality, which I think is really helpful for couples who are uh, struggling w specifically with male factor issues. Exactly. I, I'm very clear with the patients that we handle, stop alcohol. That's number one. Or if you drink a glass of wine now and then, it's fine. 
binge, binge drinking, very bad for sperm. So stop that. You know, five, six, seven, eight beers on Saturday and next week again and next week, you're affecting your fertility. So stop that. Second, stop smoking. And number three, uh, when I worked in the States, I, I was surprised how many marijuana uh, related medications and, and smoking is happening. And if that is the case with an individual, it's not healthy, not good for sperm. Stop. You know, so there are certain things that we can be very clear about. And then your diet, adapt that. Your weight, get that down so that you slim and fit. And all those things can assist. I think the other message is if you have a male problem, make sure the female is fine. So she must have regular ovulation. And the things that you do for them is very important to find the fertile day to be sure that the mucus secretion is there at the time of the LH peak and so on. So those things are small things, but it's actually big things because often women do not know when they're fertile. They must know it. They must find it. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to just, you know, we've covered a lot and I really appreciate your time and I appreciate you for going through in such detail everything that we spoke about today. That was a very nice summary as well. <laughs> but is yeah. there anything else, given everything that we've spoken about today, that you'd like to leave the listeners with? No, I think I think I've I've repeated the the important issues, and uh, you know we must always think small. We must think about home. That is, I always tell the patients, are many roads to Rome, uh, but uh, symbolically speaking. But I prefer the small road which is the home pregnancy and it can be achieved. So one must never forget that because we are often inclined to go for the high tech and then you don't even correct the low, low level. So I always correct the home situation before I even think about any other treatment. You, you will find that sometimes people will, come to a, to a fertility setup, and male is still smoking, the female is perhaps smoking, her weight is not correct, now they do ICSI. Her chances to fail is, is high. So correct everything, and then if you deserve it, you can start looking at biotech treatment. Mm-hmm. Well, I think those are very wise words to end on. Thank you. Well, yeah. Professor Kruger, uh, Dr. Kruger, both both titles. Thank you so much for being here. Could you let the listeners know where they can go to learn more about you and what you do? And I think we'll also link some of your research papers to the, the PubMed site so that the listeners can also read up more on sperm. But Yeah, uh, they can look at the website of the clinic Evitas. So www. And then I spell Evitas means life a e v i t a s evitas a e v i t a s dot c o dot z a or they can just search evitas and they will get to the web address uh, there they get some information you know and if there's ever a, a question uh, welcome to to write email and we'll respond Okay, well, I'll be sure to link your website in the show notes page for the listeners who are on the go. And just thank thank you once again. This was a really informative. It's it's been a privilege. And as I've said, I've got this uh, line in my life. And I'm very, I've been working with the colleagues at the Jones Institute for over 30 years. We've done wonderful research together. So uh, this partnership was special, but my my experience in your beautiful country and the beautiful people that I've met and still friends and many of them came to visit us here in in Cape Town and I took some friends to the Kruger National Park which is one of my favorite places in the world so yeah it uh, I've got um, my a soft spot for your country thank you and 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 also for the opportunities that I got by going to the Jones Institute, I've 
brought some information to them and they've sharpened me and my career and helped me. So thank you for that also. Oh, well, thank you again. Yeah. And have a wonderful day. I say uh, good day and uh, perhaps we'll talk again in future. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Welcome. Good day. Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com 320. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Kruger. I found it fascinating to learn about the history of sperm analysis and how Dr. Kruger's work influenced the way that we look at sperm morphology. I thought it was interesting that there was a time when they didn't even look at it, didn't even think it was important. But I suppose, you know, on the other hand, it's not that surprising to hear that because even to this day, I've worked with so many women whose partners' sperm analyses fall below the optimal range and they're not really advised or told about it. So it's interesting to see that there was a time when they barely even looked at it at all. And even though we've made a lot of progress, it is interesting to reflect on that because one of the topics that I bring up whenever I'm talking about conception is the importance of understanding where your partner is at in terms of sperm quality. Because even though, even with all the work that Dr. Kruger did over the years to bring this topic to the forefront, we're still at the stage where many times couples aren't being advised of whether or not there's an issue. And my favorite word is thrown in there. You know, it's fine, the sperm is fine, everything's fine. But we're not really provided with the information that would help us to understand the difference between what is optimal for natural conception versus the bare minimum for procedures like IVF and IUI and, you know, ICSI and all of those different artificial reproductive technologies. So with that said, if you can think of a friend or someone that you know who would really benefit from listening to this episode, please do share this episode. The link again to share is fertilityfriday.com slash 320. And of course, I want to thank you for taking some time to tune into the show. I appreciate all of you for spreading the word about Fertility Friday and sharing the podcast with your friends. I see you tagging me on social media and sharing, and I appreciate it so much. So thank you so much for being a part of the Fertility Friday community. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.